Welcome to the overview of the legislative branch and public policy as we delve into the U.S. Congress, the Article I of the U.S. Constitution. Glad you're joining me. So how well do you know your Congress? How well do you know who the representative is for your district, your senators, your members of the House of Representatives? How many are there? How many senators? How long does a, a, a representative, a member in the House of Representatives actually serve? How about a senator? Um, pause and take a look at these questions if you don't know the answers. Hopefully you will by the end of this, uh, of this overview video. Um, but we're going to uh, take you through the ins and outs of the Congress, of how public policy is created, and hopefully it'll give you a better idea of what happens in government uh, in the legislative branch. So we start with the Congress, looking at the bicameral legislature, the idea of the Senate and the House of Representatives. The Senate, the upper chamber, the House, the lower chamber, the people's house, closest to the people, elected by the people every two years versus the Senate every six. Uh, this is the power of the legislative branch. These are the people, the 535 that make the laws. They're creating the public policy that we see um, daily uh, throughout uh, our government. And uh, the executive branch is executing or enforcing those laws the judicial branch interpreting them, but it's the Congress, it's the legislative branch that is making these laws, that is researching through hearings and investigations uh, in order to create better public policy uh, that stands the test of time, that stands constitutional scrutiny. Um, and we look first at the Senate. Now, notice this was part of the New Jersey New Jersey plan that led to the uh, Connecticut Compromise, the Great Compromise. Uh, states are represented equally here. So every state gets two uh, senators. Uh, and so Wyoming, with 400,000 people, gets two senators. And California, with 55 million people, gets two senators. Um, this is the idea of equal representation that was, uh, that was agreed upon by the founders and framers. So New Jersey gets two, Wyoming gets two, uh, California gets two, and Maryland gets two. Um, now keep in mind that senators were originally um, going to be uh, selected by state legislatures. They were. Uh, they were the ones who uh, selected, not elected, um, those to uh, represent the state. And uh, so they went off to Washington uh, on behalf of their state legislatures in order to do this. Now, the 17th Amendment changed that and called for the direct election of senators to serve. Uh, they, they all serve six-year terms. Uh, but the 17th Amendment changed that uh, so that now it's not just the House that is directly elected, but the Senate as well. Uh, the Senate is also less formal. It's important to note there are 100 members of the Senate. Over in the House, you have 435 people. Can you imagine if you didn't have some level of formality uh, or, and, and rules uh, guiding what was happening there? You'd have chaos. Uh, so it is much easier to have less formal rules and fewer of them uh, in a body of 100 versus 400, a very big difference there. And what we see here is uh, that we see a lot of coalitions uh, that develop around um, uh, senators and uh, around uh, those, uh, the, uh, the amount of time they're in their term. So a lot of cases, uh, they're able to look at public policy. They're much more cautious and deliberative. They only have to run every six years, not every two. And so in looking at this, um, they're not constantly running for re-election. Uh, I would argue uh, that the uh, the senator I worked for always said, you know, the, the, the day you get elected is the day you start raising money for the next campaign, uh, and was one of the reasons he wanted to, to leave and get out of it. But um, but uh, they also, in having six years as opposed to two, uh, you don't have that, that uh, never-ending campaign. You can actually do some public policy work here, which is why uh, people... Uh, like uh, being a senator versus a member of the House, um, you don't have to worry about that constant re-election cycle. You have a little more time uh, to be able to address the people's work and work on public policy issues, uh, which is why we see a more deliberative body in the Senate. We see more of a cooling off period. They don't have to run for re-election every two years. Uh, so you're also going to see um, some uh, candidates uh, depending on their, their cycle, uh, that may be more centrist or more partisan, depending on where they are in that six-year term. As they near re-election, uh, they're probably going to be more, um, uh, depends on where they're, they're, what state they represent, um, a Susan Collins would be more centrist as, uh, as time went on and she ran for re-election, versus a Lindsey Graham, which would be much more partisan to try and appeal to his party uh, because he tends to um, 
he tends to win uh, those votes uh, being more partisan in that respect. So it also depends on what state you're coming from, too. Uh, the House of Representatives, again, much more formal here. You have to have rules uh, because you have 435 members. Uh, now, these people are representing about 700,000 people. I think it's about 725, about 725,000 people. Um, and uh, there are 435 of them as established um, uh, by Congress. And uh, that has been 435 since 1910. So you have 435 members, and uh, that is divided up among the states uh, through uh, gerrymandering, uh, well, through redistricting and reapportionment as a result of the census. And um, they basically uh, take the entire population of the country under the census. They divide it by 435. They see how much that uh, aligns with, uh, which in this case, uh, in 2010, was about 700,000 people. Then uh, they take the total population of a state, uh, and they divide that by 700,000, and that tells you how many representatives each state gets. Now, Maryland has eight, which tells you that we have about 5.6 million people uh, in the state of Maryland, and that is about accurate from uh, the 2010 census. Um, so the idea here is uh, that district is going to be the same uh, all across the country. Now, you're going to say, wait a minute, Rodman, you were just talking about Wyoming having 400,000 people. Yes, because every state, according to Article 1 of the Constitution, every state gets at least one member, okay? Uh, so they have to get at least one because they have to be represented in the House and the Senate. So every state gets at least one member. So that is the exception. Uh, otherwise, they really try and hew to that 700,000 number if you have more than one member. Uh, in the House of Representatives. Now, uh, this is the only position that is directly elected under the Constitution. Uh, now, the 17th Amendment changed that for senators, uh, but under the original Constitution, this was the only position uh, that was directly elected by the people. Uh, so uh, that is significant. They serve two-year terms. Uh, it is much more formal, as I mentioned, and much more rules-oriented in terms of uh, what they're uh, what they're doing here. And um, we also see coalitions forming. Uh, we see a lot of caucuses, a uh, kind of uh, interest groups uh, for members uh, that are that are developed here. And um, and they're doing this not just um, not really uh, in terms of fundraising, but more in terms of policy uh, in trying to address policy issues uh, on behalf of those groups. And I'll talk more about that uh, as we as we move on. So um, these members that are running for re-election in, in this capacity are called incumbents, uh, and a, an incumbent is a powerful, uh, the idea of the power of incumbency is a very powerful tool uh, because most uh, of those incumbents tend to get re-elected. Now, uh, it depends on what state you're from, it depends on what your positions are, policy positions, and how, um, how supportive the people of your state are uh, or your district are in terms of supporting your candidacy. If you're um, in a district that is what we call a safe seat, uh, something that uh, you're a Republican or a Democrat and, and your uh, district is majority your party, uh, then, then uh, you have what is, is called a safer seat. Uh, if you're in a swing district that tends to go back and forth, then you are not uh, as safe as some of those safe seats would be. So um, your district may be more vulnerable to that. So some advantages of incumbency. Notice uh, the franking privilege. This is where uh, the uh, members of Congress and senators basically sign their name where a stamp goes. And a lot of times they just sign the signature and then they're pre-printed envelopes um, that have their name on it. And uh, uh, until 90 days before the election, which we're obviously in that 90-day period now, you can't get any mailings from members of Congress because they can't they they can't do that before an election. Um, but they they can uh, mail things for free to uh, constituents to uh, voters to people that they serve. Those are called constituents. And um, and the idea there is um, it's a great way to showcase what you're doing on behalf of the people that you represent uh, in Washington. Uh, so it gives you name recognition. Uh, you're on the news. Uh, you're you know cutting the ribbon for the new highway or a new bridge. Um, it's a lot easier to raise money when you're an incumbent because you have the office to which you can uh, go out and talk to people, uh, hold those rubber chicken dinners and uh, kiss babies and shake hands and, and talk uh, on behalf of, of Congress because you're a member of Congress or a senator. It's a lot easier to raise money that way. You also have experience to back you up. But again, that can be a double-edged sword. If you haven't done much uh, and you don't have a record to tout, it's going to be a lot harder to show that experience. Uh, you can also do things uh, for your constituents called constituent services or policy work, uh, casework. 
uh, what they call it. Uh, the idea here that you're going to um, a member, uh, a, a member of your your uh, congressional district calls up and says, "Hey, I, um, I I didn't get my social security check today. Can can you help me?" Uh, and you have a staffer that can call the social security administration, uh, loop them in, find out what happened to their check, and get them a check out right away. Uh, they love you for that, uh, and and that is why. Um, People tend to love their their members of Congress, not so much the rest of Congress. Um, notice the uh, the chart here showing that about 51 percent of people have a favorable rating of the representative in their district. But notice uh, Congress as a whole is actually about half that. Um, they uh, they look at Congress as a whole in terms of of being people that oh really I mean do we really need them? Can't we just throw the bums out? Um, that is kind of the uh, the overall take, because it's easier to hate people that you don't know. But when, when it comes to my member, well, you know, I called up there and we had an issue with a highway uh, that had all kinds of potholes and, and issues that needed to be addressed by the State Highway Administration. And they really got on that and they got the Department of Transportation out there and uh, working with the state in order to, to address those issues. Um, I really like them. They, they helped me out a lot. That's the constituent service uh, that people remember when they go to the ballot box. Uh, and those those transactions uh, taking place there really tend to help um, uh, convince those voters that may be on the fence. And then pork. Uh, pork is a big one, right? If it's easier to raise money, it's also easier to bring back money for your, your state or for your district. Uh, bringing back the pork is the idea of winning pet projects in national government budgets uh, for your district, uh, for the companies that are in your district to help create jobs. Uh, and those earmarks uh, which we don't hear as much about today because uh, a lot of those have been banned. But uh, but pork is alive and well in Washington. We see all kinds of projects, uh, infrastructure projects, highway projects, education projects, grants uh, in the form of, of this, that, and the other um, that help incumbents in, in, in Congress uh, to get reelected. And they use those uh, in, in the mailings that they send out in the name recognition to help raise money and to secure votes. Uh, so there is a lot to be said for incumbency in terms of uh, those members getting reelected. And again, it depends on if they're in a safe seat or not, but this goes a long way, even if you're not in a safe seat, if you're in a swing district, uh, this goes a long way to help you uh, get in front of those voters that you need to in order to try and uh, win reelection. Uh, and that is, uh, these are some of the surefire ways to do it. So what was the intention of Congress? Um, it's important to note that, you know, the founders and framers sat down and they really uh, outlined three branches of government. The idea of separation of powers was that they would be co-equal. Um, and, uh, and that was by design, uh, that we had a, a branch of government, the legislative branch that made the laws, the executive branch that enforced those laws, and the judicial branch that interpreted those laws. Um, but it really was also by design. And if you look at the, the, um, the framers that were presidents, they really saw Congress as the dominant branch of government in terms of carrying out the people's business on a regular basis, in terms of making good policy uh, to try and address the needs of the people. It was really Congress that was designed to do this. And, and you can look at people like George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, um, and uh, James Madison, even, even uh, James Monroe. Um, when they were presidents, they really took uh, a step back in terms of seeing their role as not being the dominant branch of government, as really being a check on the legislative branch um, and really uh, letting Congress take the lead. And so what we saw during those administrations uh, was a Congress that was much more powerful, that was much more dominant. Uh, we didn't see the president being a uh, using the bully pulpit uh, to be a policy agenda setter uh, like we do today uh, in, in terms of not just the Trump administration, but the Obama administration and the Bush administration and the Clinton administration. Um, you know, you go back, uh, you know, 30, 40 years, you continue to see presidents that are much more uh, dominant in terms of setting the agenda. Uh, we didn't see that when the founders and framers uh, first wrote the Constitution. The intention was that Congress would be that dominant branch, that, to, that, that each one would be separate and equal, uh, that they would be uh, separate branches with their own roles and responsibilities, that they would have checks and balances on each other, uh, but that Congress would really be driving the message here. Because the idea was there would be, uh, well, uh, House members, 435 today, uh, but 100 senators, uh, that these 535 people would really be representing the 300 million people that we have in the country and really would be better uh, to set that agenda, to really move forward with, with policies 
that would address the needs of these uh, individuals. It would balance out uh, the needs and the issues of those large states, uh, as well as the small states, and the needs in various regions and areas of the country when it came to disasters uh, and, and relief bills and that sort of thing. But it was really a design that Congress would be the ones to carry that out, and the, the president would serve more as a check. Uh, in terms of enforcing the laws, carrying out the laws, and then checking Congress when they got out of line with the power of veto, um, and in making nominations uh, to the cabinet and to the courts. Uh, but it really was uh, the, the intention of of uh, the framers to have Congress uh, be that be that branch and play that role. So some things to think about and um, uh, here. Why do you think the House is more formal and, and rules based than the Senate? If you uh, can't answer that, then I would go back and watch what we just covered uh, under the U.S. Constitution. Who was a senator's constituency and who was a representative's constituency? Again, if you can't answer that based on what we've just covered, go back and look at the uh, at the video again. I think it will help you. How could the different constituencies lead to differences in formality and rules? Uh, why would an anti-federalist likely be horrified by the 17th Amendment? <laughs> true, true. And following the 17th Amendment, who is a senator's constituency today? Uh, very important in terms of, of outlining uh, that role. Now, it's uh, good to note uh, Federalist 62, which we don't really cover, but um, James Madison talked about uh, the idea of a bicameral legislature here and the impact on the policymaking process. I love this quote. Another advantage accruing from equality of representation in the Senate in the Constitution of the Senate is the additional impediment that it must prove against improper acts of legislation. No law or resolution can now be passed without the concurrence of a majority of the people and then of a majority of the states. Uh, this is the idea of, of, of uh, amending the Constitution, right? So uh, you would need a majority of the people to do so, uh, Congress, uh, to basically approve this on behalf of the people, and then a majority of the states uh, to ratify or approve those, those amendments. And it must be acknowledged that this complicated check on legislation may in some instances be injurious as well as beneficial. And that the peculiar defense, and that was the cautious and deliberative aspect, right? Uh, that their legislation would be, um, in some instances, injurious as well as beneficial. But it was complicated for a reason. It was hard to pass laws because they wanted them to be good laws that stood the test of time. Uh, that, that were good laws on behalf of the American people, all of the American people. And that the peculiar defense, which it involves in favor of the small states, would be more rational if any interests common to them and distinct from those of the other states would otherwise be exposed to peculiar danger. Again, uh, serving as this, uh, as this cooling off period within the Senate uh, to be more cautious, to be more deliberative body uh, that, that is uh, not the, the tyranny of the majority and the whims of the masses that we see over in, in the House, but a, a cooling off period, uh, really thinking through the ramifications of a bill like this and really trying to address them in a way that makes good laws uh, that, again, can stand the test of time. So some enumerated powers, and we'll look at these in detail. Article 1, Section 8 uh, addresses the powers that are enumerated or given or expressed to Congress in terms of what they can do. Some important aspects are tax power, spending power, and commerce. Um, these are things like passing a budget, raising taxes, borrowing money, coining that money, declaring war, and regulating commerce, which we saw through Gibbons v. Ogden. So some enumerated powers that we see here of Congress uh, are the idea of collecting taxes, providing for the common defense, establishing post offices, um, regulating commerce under the Commerce Clause, naturalization laws and bankruptcy as well, coining money, and uh, establishing the lower courts. The Judiciary Act of 1789 would establish that. Uh, in addition, we also have the declaration of war, uh, raising and maintaining armies and navies, naval and land forces, uh, creating a militia, and arming, organizing, and disciplining that militia, including a reserve uh, in order to address this, as well as governing the District of Columbia. And are you ready for it? The big one, uh, the one that we always talk about, the Elastic Clause, making all laws which shall be necessary and proper uh, and all other powers vested by this Constitution. This is giving the Congress, the legislative branch, a significant amount of power here, um, which obviously would give the Anti-Federalists pause, uh, ultimately the reasons why they wanted a Bill of Rights, uh, why they wanted those Ten Amendments to the Constitution. But that, that Elastic Clause, that Necessary and Proper Clause, really addressing 
uh, the idea of implied powers, really giving them more power uh, than you can ever imagine. And there's some explainers here uh, on, on the elastic clause uh, that you can click on in the chapter notes that I think you'll find helpful. But this idea of making all laws, which shall be necessary and proper, and carrying into execution those powers is giving Congress a lot of leeway in terms of implied powers, things that aren't expressly uh, stated in the Constitution, but are giving Congress the power uh, to kind of carry that out and, re and, and do it in a way um, that still sticks within the limits of what is uh, a, a power that the Congress has. So uh, again, looking at review here, you can pause this in order to try and answer these questions. If you can't answer them, go back and take a look at this section of 2.1 uh, on Congress. I think you'll find them helpful. As we look to 2.2, this is, uh, and by the way, these are all, these, these sections are set up by the uh, course exam description by the College Board. So 2.2 is the structures, powers, and functions of Congress, looking at the Senate and the House, which is what we'll look at in this section. So notice some of the non-legislative powers of the Senate. They have the power advi of advice and consent, uh, the idea to confirm judicial nominations, cabinet heads, uh, heads of agencies um, that we will talk more about in the, uh, the chapter on the bureaucracy. Uh, they also have the power to ratify treaties. The president uh, proposes those treaties with other nations, uh, but they bring them back to the Senate. Woodrow Wilson was unsuccessful in getting the League of Nations off the ground because he couldn't get that treaty ratified in the Senate. Uh, it ultimately killed it, and uh, many speculate led to uh, what happened uh, with World War II. Um, so ratifying treaties is a very powerful uh, um, point in terms of a non-legislative power that the Senate has here. Um, so um, this is significant in terms of powers uh, that the Senate has and uh, not to be taken lightly. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, George Washington only asked once for advice and consent in this category. Uh, he was so bewildered uh, by the advice uh, that they did give him that he never went back again to ask them for more advice uh, and consent. Uh, he uh, he said, I, I think I'll kind of go it on my own on that one. So I always find that funny. But um, but Senate leadership in looking at the Senate today, um, we uh, we see who are the, the leaders in the Senate. And we also see uh, who has the power. OK, uh, so I kind of put an asterisk who has the real power. Uh, the president of the Senate uh, is the vice president of the United States. But the vice president only has power in tie breaking votes. The vice president does not hang out in the Senate. Yes, he has an office there in the Capitol, um, but he's only there in the event of a tie. Now, um, when Congress, uh, when the Senate um, is voting on a bill and it comes down to the wire where it is kind of a 50 50 and, and the, the vice president is needed, uh, they're definitely, the majority leader's office is definitely calling the vice president, having them on speed dial, and making sure that the vice president is there. Uh, to, to cast that tie-breaking vote, uh, but most of the time uh, the bills don't uh, don't come down to the wire like that. So the vice president is only used in that capacity. Otherwise, it's a very ceremonial role. Uh, Lyndon Johnson took on that role and was really excited to come back to the Senate as vice president, only to find out that they really didn't want him there. They're like, "What are you doing here?" Um, and uh, and because he was majority leader uh, for some time, uh, and uh, and that was that was significant. Uh, but he saw the the vice presidential role as being very different than what it would ultimately become for him. Uh, and, uh, and, and later, as president, he would find ways to work with them. But as vice president, um, that, uh, that was uh, less than, than what he anticipated. Uh, the Senate majority leader is really the, the power broker here. Uh, this is, uh, uh, sorry, and I mentioned uh, the vice president of the, of the United States is actually the president of the Senate. That's Mike Pence right now. And um, he is uh, formerly uh, from Indiana. Um, uh, he served as governor of, formerly as governor of Indiana, and uh, he is a Republican uh, in the Trump administration uh, from Indiana. And um, the Senate Majority Leader is uh, Mitch McConnell, a Republican from Kentucky. Uh, he is the senior senator from Kentucky, um, Rand Paul, the junior senator from Kentucky. Uh, he is up for re-election this year, Mitch McConnell. By the way, Trent, uh, Pence is too uh, on, on the ballot. But the idea here is that the Senate Majority Leader really holds the power in the Senate. They determine the agenda. They determine the schedule, um, what business is conducted and isn't. Uh, right now, uh, the business, the only business that's being conducted is the Judiciary Committee hearings um, on the, um, the, the nominee uh, for the Supreme Court to fill uh, Justice uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg's seat. That's Amy Coney Barrett. Um, that is the only uh, business, official business, that's taking place in the Senate right now because they are on um, 
on on break, lockdown, whatever you want to call it, in relation to the coronavirus, uh, COVID-19, with so many of them being above 70 years old, um, and uh, and and many of them octogenarians in addition to septuagenarians, um, it, they're very susceptible to that. Um, but uh, but the majority leader sets that agenda, sets that schedule. Now we also have the Senate Minority Leader. Uh, this is Chuck Schumer, uh, Charles Schumer, excuse me, a Democrat from uh, New York. He is the senior senator from New York, and um, this is chosen by the minority party, just like the majority leader is chosen by the majority party. Um, there's not a whole lot of power here by the minority leader, so you are the loyal opposition, pretty much. Um, some procedural issues um, that they can do, some filibustering, but that has largely uh, gone away on on a lot of uh, more um, controversial issues, and there's really not much else uh, that they can do there. Now, the Senate whips are basically the vote counters. They're the ones that are whipping their party into shape in terms of getting them to fall in line with the way the party wants them to vote. Um, they count the votes. Uh, they are the vote counters, and they're going to work with senators and their staffs uh, on those votes that are coming up and the uh, the priorities that their party has. Um, but uh, the the majority whip uh, in the Senate is John Cornyn. He is the uh, senior senator from Texas, and uh, the uh, the senior senator from Illinois is the minority whip. He is Dick Durbin. And we have heard from both of them. Uh, both of the whips are actually on the Judiciary Committee, so we've heard from them this week in those hearings. Uh, but again, uh, the whips don't have a whole lot of authority. It really comes from the majority leader, uh, other than to, um, to uh, liaise with your uh, senators uh, that are in your party and try and get them in line for votes uh, in, in terms of lining up the votes there. So um, some tie-breaking votes that the vice president has cast, you can notice uh, that happened more in the uh, John Adams and John Calhoun administrations uh, than is anything that we see today um, and uh, in terms of how this breaks down. So we don't see nearly as many tie-breaking votes uh, um, as what we saw then, but um, but the idea here is uh, that they are available. Uh, they are available in uh, that period of time, um, and um, and and it is significant when they do step in to break a tie-breaking vote. They're going to align with their party and their party's agenda in doing so. Uh, it's interesting to note. Uh, I asked. I added the question here uh, that um, Biden had no tie-breaking votes, um, and he served eight years in office. Now, some of that is because uh, his party did not control the Senate when he was vice president, so that does have an impact uh, for, for a majority of that time. Um, but, uh, but we see some tie-breaking votes being cast by vice presidents there over time. I think that's an interesting graphic. I like that one. Um, some floor debate in terms of the Senate, uh, looking at this less formal aspect and less rules than what they would have over in the House, uh, we, see, um, we see writers, uh, and these are things that are, aren't necessarily... Um, uh, related to a bill, non-germane or not related to uh, to an, uh, a bill, but are amending are, are amendments to a bill uh, in terms of trying to address there, uh, trying to address something maybe for the voters back home. Uh, holds, uh, you're trying to prevent a bill from being brought to the floor by placing a hold. One senator can place a hold on a bill, and it does not go any further. Uh, that is a power that senators have that House members do not. Um, and so even the majority leader can't release a hold, uh, and uh, they will work with their party to uh, to fall in line with their agenda, uh, but they, they cannot release a hold. It's the senator that does so. Um, filibustering, uh, and again, this, uh, this has been changing over the last few years uh, since the Obama administration, and um, we've seen uh, the lowering of the number. It used to be 60 votes were needed to close a filibuster or end one. Filibuster is basically talking a bill to death. Uh, you stand up, you talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and talk, and um, and eventually people go, okay, okay, forget it, kill the bill. We know you're not going to let the bill pass. Okay, we get it. Um, one of the most famous filibusters um, was uh, of the civil rights legislation. It was uh, uh, West Virginia Senator um, uh, Rick, uh, Robert Byrd uh, that filibustered the civil rights bill uh, that was uh, trying to be passed, and um, and that was significant because all business stopped at that particular point. Now, today we have a dual track filibuster system in which um, uh, other business continues on the dual track uh, while the filibuster is continuing to slow a bill or keep it from 
from uh, being discussed. Uh, but cloture can kill a filibuster. So a filibuster talking a bill to death. Cloture is a way to close. Cloture is Latin for closure, uh, and that is closing down or shutting down a filibuster. And um, on most bills, you need 60 members in order to do, do so, a supermajority. So if your party and the majority party is Republican, if you have 53 votes, that's not 60. So for most things, uh, you would need 60 votes. You need people from the other side to vote for cloture in order to fill up, uh, end a filibuster. Uh, so it's very hard to do that. Now, there have been some exceptions to that because um, the in the Obama years, uh, the uh, Senate Majority Leader at the time, Harry Reid, a Democrat with the Democratic majority, actually lowered uh, for, for judicial nominations, lowered to 50 instead of 60, uh, the number of votes that were needed, 51, sorry, uh, that were needed in order to pass a judicial nomination. Now, the minority leader at the time, uh, a Republican, uh, who is now the Senate Majority Leader, Mitch McConnell, uh, said, uh, that your party will rue the day that you did this, uh, and uh, here we are, what, 200 nominations later uh, by justices to the, the federal judiciary by the Trump administration, and uh, I guess that is the, the rue the day that he was referring to. Um, so uh, you're not always going to be the party in power, uh, and many times you'll be the party in the minority, and by, uh, by, by pushing the nuclear option button, basically uh, lowering the, the cloture, uh, status to 50 votes or 51 votes uh, instead of 60, uh, basically uh, reducing the power of the filibuster. Um, when the uh, when the other party came into power, they were able to use it to their advantage. So we see significant changes there in terms of um, in terms of cloture and to be continued. Um, during the funeral of George Floyd, we heard President Obama talk about uh, the filibuster being a uh, uh, an uh, a relic of a Jim Crow, a relic from the Jim Crow era, uh, being uh, very much um, something uh, that was used in the South in order to prevent civil rights legislation from being passed. Uh, so to be continued, we will see how that plays out. Um, but um, we do see that the that the rules have changed on on cloture to end filibusters, making it easier for cloture, making making it easier to kill a filibuster. And uh, there has been some talk if the Democrats get control of the Senate, will they kill the fil filibuster altogether uh, in terms of uh, in terms of that power? So uh, we'll see what happens. Um, the uh, the uh, overriding uh, factor that uh, Lindsey Graham said in the nominations of the Obama justices to the court was elections have consequences. Uh, and um, and the idea is that uh, in November, elections do have consequences. So we will see how that plays out. Uh, a couple of examples here that I want to mention. Uh, I mentioned riders uh, in terms of non-germane amendments to bills. We see this all the time in terms of stealth legislation, uh, uh, different senators putting in riders, things that are amendments to a bill in, uh, that may be controversial. They're trying to sneak it in. Uh, we also see the holds. Uh, Shelby puts a hold on Obama nominations. Uh, this is quite uh, common. If a senator is upset about uh, a way a piece of legislation is being uh, conducted or implemented um, or, or, uh, or discussed and, and debated, uh, they may put a hold on the bill in order to slow it down. Uh, I mentioned the, um, the civil rights bill um, that uh, uh, Senator Byrd uh, and, and Senator Thurman uh, were, were opposing. Uh, this was uh, Civil Rights Act of 1957. Uh, we would see another one in 1964 from Robert Byrd, uh, but this was a 24-hour filibuster um, and uh, some speculation there. Today, uh, with the filibuster, as I mentioned, we see the double tracking or the dual tracking in terms of um, in terms of addressing additional uh, work of the Senate while the filibuster is going on, so you don't stop all business anymore. So that is uh, significant. But one of the things that we do see is a significant increase in uh, the use of the filibuster uh, in terms of, of what we saw back in 19, the 1950s and 60s versus what we see today. So you can see that that has definitely changed in terms of the role there. Whether it is, uh, you know, it's a, up to you in terms of whether that is um, uh, something that is relevant or something that needs to go away. Again, I guess the Senate will decide. Um, and uh, and you can be the judge in terms of how that plays out. Uh, but it's definitely an issue in this election, and we, we've been seeing it over and over again in terms of people talking about it on both sides of that particular issue, people who say uh, it needs to be protected because it protects the minority in terms of um, uh, depending on who's in power and who's not in power, and uh, also in terms of, uh, well, it does too much protecting of, uh, of groups uh, that 
that are necessarily trying to keep others from power. Uh, and so there is this back and forth and, uh, and a significant, um, and a significant debate uh, going on there, and I'm sure will continue to go on there as as we move forward. Uh, it's important to note some unanimous consent agreements. Uh, this is the idea that um, the that a lot of the business and and most of, of of stuff that gets done is actually through unanimous consent. They don't vote on every particular bill or issue. A lot of the work that is done, agreements on. Um, on the um, the structure of how they carry things out, uh, the the policies, the rules, the 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 um, the less formal rules in the Senate, but a lot of this is done through unanimous consent. Uh, they agree in terms of terms. Um, all of this uh, uh, type of thing uh, is going to uh, be done through unanimous consent. Uh, the idea that everybody agrees, and unless somebody disagrees, uh, they're going to move forward with that. Uh, so that is uh, traditionally what we would see here. Okay, so uh, we've talked a lot about the Senate. Let's go over to the House, uh, 435 members in the House of Representatives, and we see that any tax or revenue bill uh, that is introduced uh, in terms of you're going to change um, the the uh, the people's taxes, uh, either raise them or lower them, uh, you're going to implement uh, new revenue. All of this needs to start in the House, and that is per Article 1 of the U.S. Constitution. Uh, any type of, of changes to taxes or revenue is going to have to start in the people's house. That is closest to the people, and it should be the people uh, that, uh, uh, that represent the constituents of the American people that, that make those decisions because they're going to have to face election before anybody else. So um, this would start in the House and specifically in the House Ways and Means Committee. This is addressing uh, those tax and revenue bills. Now, why did the framers give the House that power? As I mentioned, because they're more accountable to citizens having uh, to run for election every two years um, and also seeing uh, that in the Great Compromise that they're represented by population. So a smaller, uh, the idea was a smaller uh, senators are going to represent the entire state. Uh, members of the House are going to represent particular districts, which is much easier for the people to get to those people, to those members, to talk to them about things they like or don't like that government is doing. So uh, that was really important there, uh, that that that, um, that, the, that be initiated in the, the House first and then go to the Senate. Uh, but tax and, and revenue bills would start there. And the power of impeachment, uh, the role that the, the House of Representatives plays in indicting a president or a judge, and that is to bring up on charges, okay? Impeachment means to bring up on charges. It doesn't mean that we're holding a trial yet. Uh, that trial and conviction or acquittal is done in the Senate. Power of impeachment is the power to indict. Uh, the power to bring up on charges. That is what an impeachment means. Uh, so uh, definitely note the, the significance and the difference there in terms of how that plays out. Looking at the leadership of the House, um, it is the speaker that is the most powerful person uh, in terms of setting the agenda and presiding over the House. Um, the um, minority is the loyal opposition. Uh, the minority uh, leader uh, that we see here uh, is the loyal opposition, and uh, they don't really have a whole lot of power. They don't set the agenda. Uh, they are informed by the speaker in terms of what happens, and they have both been in the majority and the minority. So um, Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, has sweeping powers, uh, but she knows she's been a minority leader before. She's also been the speaker before. Um, she is the first woman elected uh, Speaker of the House, not once but twice, um, when her party regained power. And uh, and the idea here is it, there are a lot more restrictions on discussions and debates that are held in the House because you have 435 members. That's a lot of people. So not everybody's going to get to talk on a bill. Not everybody is going to get to speak un in unlimited amounts of time. Uh, everybody's going to be very limited, and there are limited numbers of people on both sides uh, of the aisle that are going to be able to address these issues. So maybe you get uh, 40 members of the Democratic Party, 40 members of the Republican Party that speak for five minutes each on this bill. Um, there are much greater rules that are in place here as a result of um, the fact that there's 435 people. Um, and so we have a Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, a Democrat from California. Um, she represents the district around San Francisco. Uh, majority leader is uh, Steny Hoyer. He is from Maryland. He represents... Um, um, the um, uh, Prince George's County and um, and uh, some other aspects uh, of, of Maryland, but mainly Prince George's County. Um, the majority whip is uh, James Clyburn. 
He is the uh, Democratic member from South Carolina. You may remember him in terms of uh, he was the individual who came out endorsing Joe Biden in the South Carolina primary, which basically turned that primary on its head and gave uh, Joe Biden uh, Joe Biden's campaign life once again, which led to him being the nominee for president. Um, I don't think that would have been possible without James Clyburn uh, in that role. So a uh, significant player in South Carolina politics there. And then we see uh, the minority uh, the minority leadership team um, here. We have the uh, minority leader, Kevin McCarthy, uh, who is from uh, California, representative, uh, Republican representative from California. And then uh, Stephen Scalise uh, is the minority whip. Now, remember, the whips count the votes. They're the ones that whip their party uh, members into line and count the votes to make sure they have what they need there. Um, and you may remember Stephen Scalise uh, from the, um, the the practice softball game in which the shooter showed up uh, and shot um, um, uh, some members, uh, didn't kill anybody, luckily. Uh, but Stephen Scalise uh, was shot in that uh, incident in, in Arlington and um, and did survive and, uh, and came back and uh, represents California. Uh, sorry, he represents Louisiana. I apologize for the error. Um, he represents Louisiana, and um, and he is the minority whip. So he and James Clyburn really whip up the votes. Uh, they're counting the votes uh, to see how many votes they need, how many votes they have, uh, and reporting back to leadership on that. Uh, so floor debate. Let's talk about that for a second. In terms of the House of Representatives, much more formal, as I mentioned, a lot more rules. Um, and uh, to represent that they have more rules, they have a rules committee. Uh, the rules committee is addressing uh, how much debate time we have, uh, what is the time limit, um, and this is the most powerful committee uh, that is there in terms of uh, in terms of legislation. Uh, we see the tax and uh, the House Ways and Means Committee is very powerful when it comes to tax and revenue legislation, uh, but the rules committee is is uh, is setting the rules for all legislation. So very powerful committee. Uh, all of these members are appointed by the speaker. Again, the speaker has sweeping powers in terms of addressing uh, the, uh, in picking the those that are on the rules committee. And they're not editing the bill. They're just determining the rules for debate, uh, the, the schedule for those uh, debates, how many members can speak on each side of the aisle uh, on these bills. Is it a closed rule bill, meaning uh, that there are no amendments being offered, or is it an open bill, uh, open rule, in terms of amendments can be offered uh, even on the floor? Um, we don't see that as much anymore. We see more closed rule uh, because they're really tightening their grip on uh, legislation in order to try and get it passed. Uh, there is a germaneness requirement that we didn't see in the Senate. We do see it here. Again, more rules in the House because there are more members. So um, it does need to be relevant. Uh, any amendments that are offered need to be relevant, need to be on topic, need to be what we call germane uh, to the legislation that's being offered. And usually if a member gets to speak, it's five minutes or less. Uh, in terms of the, the amount of time that they have to speak. So very limited in nature there. Now, we also have a discharge petition. Uh, we have committees, and we're going to talk a lot about those uh, coming up. But the uh, the committees here um, aren't the only way that you can get a bill passed. You can actually um, get the, the majority of the House to vote on a discharge petition, which can essentially force it out of the committee. Um, committee chairs, as you can imagine, don't like that. Uh, because it basically uh, usurps their authority and goes over their head uh, to basically take the bill out of their possession and into um, into the um, into the the the, the house uh, the committee of the whole, for instance, that could then decide on this. By the way, uh, if the uh, quorum isn't reached in the Judiciary Committee over in the Senate, they can do the same thing. Uh, they can use a discharge petition to move uh, the bill from, uh, and this, this may be quite likely in the Amy Coney Barrett model um, uh, of this uh, nominee to the court, because um, in the rules, they need a majority, uh, in order to get quorum, uh, they need a, um, a simple majority of members, um, they need uh, at least 50% of the members, and at least two from uh, members from each party. Uh, and so that may be hard to get in order to get a quorum. Uh, so we may not even see a vote in this Judiciary Committee. Uh, there may be a discharge petition coming that would send it to the floor of the Senate um, in order to uh, discharge it from the committee because they can't get a quorum in order to hold a vote. Uh, but who knows? Uh, that That's pretty extreme in terms of, of that, but um, is probably one of uh, only a few uh, procedural items that uh, Democrats have left in terms of 
uh, stalling this nomination. Uh, but the Committee of the Whole would then decide on this particular bill, uh, just like in the House or the Senate, uh, that they would do this here. Um, there are different rules. They're going to try and really shut things down and close the rules uh, so that uh, they can get things through quickly, uh, less controversially, less uh, room for amendments, less room for debate, uh, really move things quickly in order to um, to get this uh, passed and then they'll dissolve the Committee of the Whole, and uh, then it becomes the House of Representatives once again. So uh, that's kind of how the discharge petition process uh, works in this uh, capacity. Now, where does most work get done? It gets done in standing committees. Standing committees are permanent. They're the ones with the signs on the door um, that says, hey, we're the Ways and Means Committee, or we're the uh, Committee on Intelligence, or, or whatever the case may be. These are the ones that are investigating. These are the ones that are holding hearings. Uh, they're proposing bills. They're marking up bills. Uh, they're discussing bills. They're interviewing uh, expert witnesses. Uh, they're calling in um, uh, witnesses, uh, members, uh, leaders of, from the agencies and the departments uh, within the executive branch uh, to talk to them about uh, what's going on in their agency and and uh, how does this affect the legislation that they're they're trying to carry out. So they're going to hold hearings. They're going to investigate. They're going to ask questions. Um, and this is a part of their job uh, in, in terms of, of getting good legislation uh, out of their committee and, and onto the House floor. So um, they're going to hold these hearings and ask questions in order to do so. Um, some, some examples of some permanent committees uh, that we see uh, in the House and in the Senate uh, are things like agriculture and the budget. Uh, we also see financial services, uh, finance in the Senate. Um, we see Judiciary Committee in the House and in the Senate. Now, the Senate Judiciary Committee has the power to approve nominations. The House Judiciary Committee has no role because the House has no role in advice and consent uh, when it comes to the president's nominations. Uh, but these are the ones with the signs on the door. They have actual meeting rooms. They are permanent. Uh, we have a lot of other committees, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, but the idea here is these are the ones uh, that are permanent, that are regular, and, and have been there for the 200 plus years uh, that our Constitution has been in existence and that this bicameral body has been in existence. Now, a joint committee um, is one in which, uh, and a conference committee is a good example of this, uh, in which you're being brought together basically to resolve differences between a bill that was passed in the House and a bill that was passed in the Senate. So you're going to have members of the House and members of the Senate come together in order to try and look at this uh, legislation and try and find compromises, try and find ways to minimally impact the bill so that you can then send it back to both chambers to for an up or down vote. No amendments, no uh, discussion or debate, really an up or down vote on the bill and hopefully get it to pass both chambers so it can go on to the president for his signature. Um, so the conference committee is where this happens. If they're successful, uh, again, the bill goes back for an up or down vote, and then it goes on to the president. So that really, and that is their only role. The only role of a conference committee is to work out the, the versions of the bill, and that's really important to note there. Now, a committee chair does have a significant influence. They're always from the majority party, uh, and they can determine um, what type of um, what type of agenda they have, what their policy priorities are, what their policy agenda is, and uh, when they're going to hear things, when they're going to call in witnesses, when they're going to uh, take up legislation that they're going to mark up, uh, and, and how long they're going to spend in doing that. Again, who gets to speak in those committee hearings? How much, how much time do they get? Which uh, people get to question witnesses, and how much time does each person have? Committee chairs uh, have significant influence over that agenda. And, and they can carry that out. Now, uh, there are obviously pros and cons uh, to this committee system uh, that we aren't won't debate here. We'll talk about in class. Uh, but the idea is here, there, there are always pros and cons uh, to these types of issues. Uh, but the committee system is alive and well. And it is really where the work gets done. Uh, this is where Congress actually does the work of the people uh, in terms of getting this done. So is it uh, easy to do? Oh, heck no. Uh, it's not easy to do. It's very difficult. And the bigger the committee, the harder it is to carry out uh, in terms of uh, getting good legislation out the door. Um, you also have uh, members of the minority party uh, that are going to try and, and add amendments to slow or stifle or kill the legislation. Um, uh, many times because, again, they're being the loyal opposition. That's their job. Uh, but uh, but this leads to uh, pros and cons of, of the committee system that we see in Congress today. Now, I mentioned caucuses earlier, and I want to come back to that. Caucuses are basically associations uh, for members uh, in terms of areas of interest. Uh, this could be a political interest, a regional interest, an economic interest. Um, so think of them like factions 
in Congress. Think of them like an interest group uh, in Congress. Uh, some of the most famous are the Congress Congressional Black Caucus and uh, the Congressional Hispanic Caucus. Um, these are obviously based on race and ethnicity, but are two very uh, prominent and uh, very powerful caucuses uh, in Congress in that the members uh, are looking at how do we uh, address legislation that addresses the issues of our CBC or the CHC. Uh, so we see this here in terms of trying to address issues their constituents have. Um, and um, this is uh, this is really critical. Now, uh, do they have any role or pow significant power in a committee or on the House floor? No, uh, not necessarily. Uh, but they can work in concert if they're with the majority party in order to push that legislation and uh, get it on the agenda. So that is really where caucuses really do have a lot of influence. Uh, now, re remember, uh, the budget is in the hands of the Congress. They're passing a federal budget. So looking at this, they have uh, some discretionary spending. Uh, there's a significant amount, not as much as you might think, a significant amount of money that they can spend each year on uh, things that are issues that they, wanna, that they really want uh, to address. Maybe it's a new highway through your district. Uh, maybe it's more money for education or defense. Um, and these are very discretionary, meaning uh, that they can be expanded or contracted depending on the agenda of uh, the majority party in the House and Senate. Uh, and they address these issues accordingly. Uh, but there's a lot of mandatory spending that's going on here. There's a lot of spending that they don't have control over. And those are things like entitlement programs, Medicare, Social Security, uh, interest on the debt. Uh, these are programs you have to pay for. You have to um, in, in terms of moving forward. And so um, this is the mandatory spending, which is eating up more and more of the overall budget. And as you can see here, uh, Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security continue to eat uh, an ever larger and larger chunk of the overall federal budget, which leads to less and less discretionary spending. So entitlement programs, uh, because uh, they are significant in terms of, of trying to address them, um, we will see uh, uh, more of this in, in a later chapter. But the idea here is um, that there's a significant amount of money that is basically locked away in terms of money that has to be spent in these areas. Yes, we're bringing in money from um, employment um, uh, payroll checks uh, for Social Security, for Medicare, for Medicaid, um, but there are a lot of other programs um, uh, that that um, the state needs money for Medicaid, uh, they need money for welfare assistance, SNAP, uh, the, uh, the food assistance, the food stamps program, uh, states also need money for that. Uh, so it's significantly eating a, a larger and larger chunk of the overall budget. And uh, notice in 2020, Social Security spending is going to be over a trillion dollars. Medicare, $679 billion. This is significant in terms of how much money uh, is coming in and how much money is going out uh, and the deficits that are created as a result of this. So we continue to see um, uh, people getting older and living longer, which is a great thing, um, but difficult in terms of budgeting because more and more money is going into the mandatory spending area, less and less so in the discretionary areas. So um, the, uh, the baby boomers living longer, longer life expectancy. Um, also, you've had some changes in, in programs that have, have cut payroll taxes uh, and uh, decreased benefits uh, in some areas. Um, of this uh, that are not politically popular. Uh, all of this is having an impact. And so um, we can also see that it's difficult uh, to try and mess with these programs. Uh, don't you touch my social security. Uh, you hear that from elderly all the time. I paid into that. Don't you touch that. So it really makes it difficult in terms of how do you balance a budget? How do you find uh, programs and funds uh, for programs that you really care about that, that are on your agenda without addressing um, those uh, those types of issues. And you got to pay for those. How do you pay for them? Uh, you can't borrow all of the, the funds that you need in terms of addressing that. So you've got to find a way uh, to balance, uh, to find a happy balance between the two. Now, some key terms to notice. Fiscal policy is all about budgets. So you think fiscal, you think budgets, taxing and spending, right? Uh, I always tell students fiscal, uh, think of fiscal street. The S and the T in the street sign is spending and taxing. Fiscal is all about budgets, spending and taxing. Now, a budget deficit means we spent more than we brought in in revenue, so we have a deficit. Uh, if we brought in more in revenue than what we spent, we'd have a surplus. Um, uh, rarely does that happen, okay? <laughs> Normally, it's a deficit. 
um, in what we've seen in, in the recent decades. Uh, it's been a budget deficit for the most part. Uh, there was a projected budget surplus back in the 90s during the, the internet uh, boom, the tech boom, um, that was projected to be, uh, but that quickly went away. So, um, so mainly what we see today are budget deficits, and uh, that contributes to the national debt, the one you see at the bottom here. Um, there have been calls for a balanced budget. Uh, the Graham-Rudman Balanced Budget Act uh, was passed by Congress and quickly ignored. Uh, so that is, um, uh, that is a lofty goal, but uh, when it comes down to trying to balance that budget, it's much tougher uh, because of those mandatory programs, because of programs that you want to carry out in discretionary spending, it's a lot harder to do so. So uh, balancing that budget much easier to talk about or pass a, a law about than it is to actually carry it out. Um, and that contributes to the national debt to the tune of what 15, 16 trillion last I checked uh, that is addressed there. These rising entitlement costs and budgetary pressures lead to a lot of these, na these uh, national uh, deficits, which uh, budget deficits, which lead to the national debt uh, in terms of what we see there and in terms of how all that plays out. We also have a lot of pork barrel spending. Uh, you can see the earmarks uh, that have taken place from time to time. Uh, legislation that is bringing pork or bringing home the bacon uh, to your district is uh, also something uh, that is, is popular. Now, you notice the earmarks have been cut off, uh, but the pork barrel spending is still coming. It's still going back to uh, districts uh, in pet projects uh, because the idea of log rolling is alive and well. You vote for my bill, I vote for yours. You vote for my spending, I vote for yours. Um, that is alive and well in, in Congress in terms of trying to address the needs of uh, the people in terms of what they're um, what they need back home in order to get reelected. And as we know, incumbency really important. Uh, they're really trying to bring home that bacon. So um, look at these review questions. And if you can't answer these, uh, I would pause here, go back and watch parts of the video. This concludes part one of Congress. In the next part, we're going to take a look at congressional behavior. Uh, we're also going uh, to look at the importance of that congressional behavior, and particularly as it relates to public policy and the branches that are coming up. So I hope you'll stay tuned for that. For now, uh, we hope you've enjoyed part one of the Congress. Stay tuned for part two coming up next.